A Link to the Past, A Vision of the Future. The Hudson County Justice William J. Brennan Courthouse. There is history and art to be found everywhere in the world. And in Jersey City, it is because of its people's efforts, the William J. Brennan Courthouse of Hudson County, an architectural marvel, still stands today. The courthouse holds much significance to the judicial system of Hudson County, and when it was built 100 years ago, it was created to be the Cathedral of Justice. The design was inspired by the modern American Renaissance and decorated by some of the most influential artists of the time. Years later, an administrative building was built next door and the courthouse was abandoned and almost demolished to make way for a parking lot. In protest, locals fought to preserve the courthouse and succeeded in placing it in the National Register of Historic Places, after which restorations began. Construction of the courthouse began in 1906 with local Jersey City architect Hugh Roberts. Roberts had designed many homes for the wealthy residents of Hudson County, as well as commercial buildings. The design of the courthouse was inspired by the Columbian Exposition, a World's Fair held in Chicago in 1893 to celebrate the 400th anniversary of Christopher Columbus's arrival in the New World in 1492. Four years and $3.3 million later, the courthouse opened on September 20th, 1910. In those times, it was a great amount of money, and taxpayers were not happy. Hugh Roberts agreed there were areas of the courthouse where the ornamentation was, quote, overloaded. And according to Roberts, it was a decision made by the freeholders. Scandalous or not, the freeholders felt it was important they imposed the authority of the government and law on residents and to build something respectable. Using a conversion rate of $23.27 for what $1 would be worth back then, the courthouse would cost an estimated $70 million to build today. When they commissioned Hugh Roberts in the mid-first decade of the 20th century, he planned the magnificent structure that is there now. Um, however, after it was finished, there was a big outcry because his initial estimate of its cost would be $990,000. And it wound up costing slightly over $3 million. And there was such a ruckus over that that there was a committee to investigate the courthouse established and they produced a 10-page re report, which we have here in the New Jersey room. And uh, it, they took everything in the courthouse from the lighting fixtures and the metal used and the wood furniture, everything, and estimated what they thought it should cost compared to what it did cost. The people who did it had an understanding that they weren't building a building for 25 years. They were building it for 100 or 100 plus years. And I think that they also understood that uh, the justice system warranted something that was impressive. And so if you had business here, if you, were, you worked here or you came to court in this building, you were shown something about what we, how we value the justice system, a lot in the way of a school. If you, if you send kids into a school that's run down with broken windows and the blackboards are cracked, you tell them that you don't really care too much about their education. If you give them uh, a good uh, stately school that is well maintained, they understand they're in a special place. And I think that anybody that walks through the doors of Brennan Courthouse understands that they're in a, they're in a special place. The Hudson County Courthouse totals at 120,000 square feet and is built of Maine granite. The exterior boasts Corinthian columns and an engraving over the main entrance on Newark Avenue reads, Precedent makes law. If you stand well, stand still. The basis of our founding of our country is on law. This is this we know from our history of founding. It's not based upon a cultural um, you know, hegemony in terms of uh, one culture. It's not based upon one language, as we are. Everyone speaks different languages, as though English is, you know, the language of choice. Um, it's based on law. So if, if the law is good, and it, you know, why, why reinvent the wheel? Why change? And that's what it means. If, if precedent makes law, you stand well, stand still. And that's the rock of our foundations of our law. 
Not only is the courthouse known for its marvelous architecture, but also known for its massive one-of-a-kind murals. Hugh Roberts delegated all interior design and ornamentation to Francis D. Millet, whom was also the director of decoration of the World's Fair. Millet acquired the help of four other muralists as artistic collaborators, Edwin H. Blashfield, Charles Yardley Turner, Kenyon Cox, and Howard Pyle had all worked alongside Millet in the then recently built Essex County Courthouse in Newark, New Jersey. So they did this exposition in 1893. We called him the World's Fair. He had the job to be the director of painting and decoration for all the buildings there. And of course, this is where he meets the people who work in this building. Um, C.Y. Turner, they work together. Um, Blashfield, um, even Howard Pyle is some way involved. Kenyon Cox, all the murals, he's there. And then, of course, they come to New Jersey and they work in the Essex County Courthouse, and that's their meeting again. And then, of course, Hugh Roberts, who is not involved with the, the, the World's Columbian Exposition in 1893, he is, he is aware of the, of the Essex County Courthouse, and he's a, a disciple of Cass Gilbert, who is the architect, and he says, well, this is what I'm going to do. If I get the job here, I'm going to bring these, these professionals here. So, you know, that's what they bring here. And of course, as individuals, you know, Frank Ouellette was a fascinating person. Interesting life he led. As a boy, he was in the Union Army in the Civil War. He was a drummer boy. And um, his first career choice was not as a painter. He goes to Europe, and he's a foreign correspondent. He's a writer. In fact, writing for a lot of the muralists here was also a, a serious trade on the side. But he, uh, he covers a lot of famous events, the Crimean War, which uh, is a famous uh, European conflict, uh, you know, a lot of tragedy there, but he covers the war and he's, he's given a medal of, of uh, courage uh, to cover, for covering that in, in action. He's, he's in the thick of the action covering it. Then he drifts to Paris. He goes and studies art there and that's how he gets his cuts his, his teeth on the art. He said at the time that this is so that 25 years from now, quarter century from now, when people come in, they can see what life was like a quarter of a century ago. And I think it's just magnificent that now we are four times that, a hundred years later, and we can still enjoy those murals. And then in the Renaissance, uh, there were many fabulous mural paintings done and which still survive, and those are what inspired the artists of this period because they were all trained in Europe, except for Howard Pyle. And they saw the buildings of France that were made to copy the Renaissance buildings, and they wanted to create a new Renaissance here. Their techniques were different, however. Most murals from this period in the United States were done on canvas, often in the artist's studio, and then they were, they were installed in place with a mixture of white lead um, and they were adhered to the wall. So they were, would be rolled up and then transported and installed here, which um, was in some ways more convenient because you could work in your studio while the construction of the building was going on. Muralist Edwin Blashfield saw his murals as forever enlisted in what he called the fight for beauty. Beauty of form, color, relationships, and proportions. He was a strong believer that in order to keep the movement of the fight for beauty alive, it could only be done through the collaboration between architect, painter, and sculptor. Yeah, the ideal was that the murals would be planned from the, from the inception of the planning of the building. They would be part of the architect's plan, and, and then the architect, painters, and sculptors would work together to make a unified work of art. The, that rarely happened. The funding was never secure until the last minute often, and so the muralists had to come in at the 11th hour and try to make it seem as though it had been planned from the beginning. But it was also hard for the artists because they weren't, um, they couldn't see everyone else's work while they were doing their own. And, and I know that Millet, who did um, these two murals here and was also in charge of the decoration, was disappointed when he saw his murals in place because he thought they were too dark in comparison with, say, Turner's murals, which were lighter. Blashfield designed the dome and the four pendentives between the arches on the fourth floor. Each one depicts a winged female figure, which are collectively referred to as the fames. Each fame 
holds a portrait of a significant person in local history. The first fame is holding a portrait of Richard Varick. He was mayor of New York and also one of three associates who founded the town of Jersey, which is now Jersey City. The second fame holds a portrait of Alexander Hamilton. He was the first United States Secretary of the Treasury, created the first federal banking system, and played an important role in the New Jersey judicial system. John Stevens' portrait, an inventor and pioneer in shipbuilding and railroading, is held by the third fame, and the fourth holds the portrait of Abraham Zabriskie. Zabriskie served as a state senator, state chancellor, lawyer, and was also one of the framers of the charter of Jersey City. Kenyon Cox was given the eight corners of the third floor. Pyle painted the walls in the freeholder's room, and Millet painted two of the four lunettes on the third floor. He hired Turner to design the other two. When visitors first walk into the courthouse, they usually stand in awe as they look around at its vast beauty. The marble floors and pillars exude elegance. Look up, and you will see the main attraction of the fourth floor, the stained glass. A painting of the signs of the zodiac surrounds the panels that make up the dome, while murals adorn the rotunda and corridor walls. In, a, in some ways, this building is even more dramatic because of the, of the way you see the grand rotunda all at once. When my art history professor came here for the symposium, she walked in and looked up and she said, and she was a specialist in the Beaux-Arts period, this period, and she said, this is Beaux-Arts heaven. I mean, it was just so dramatic that it, it impressed someone who was a specialist in that kind of art. You know, I, w I grew up not far from here. I grew up uh, in, the, the, uh, in the area here, and, and this was always closed when I was a boy. So when I first came to the building in 1989, I was uh, actually sort of interviewed for the job that I now hold. And um, they, had the, they had a Christmas tree in the rotunda, which we still do. And I walked in from the Newark Avenue entrance. And, um, and again, I, I had never been here before. Always just passed by the structure and just never paid any mind. I walked in. And I was overwhelmed. I was overwhelmed, and I'm in no exaggeration. And I had, had no clue this building existed in this county. The Zodiac is believed to have been designed by Edwin Blashfield and completed by his assistants, Vincent Adorente and Alonzo E. Foringer. B. E. Freund designed the stained glass, and Millet and Turner painted the four major murals in the rotunda. Gorgeous murals in the courtrooms and uh, public corridors of the courthouse depicting scenes from Hudson County's history and the founding of, of, of Bergen. So, uh, you know, both in what it, what it uh, signified as uh, the community's as aspiration as, uh, you know, being a place of, of commerce and, and, and a place of, uh, of, of tremendous economic potential. It's why so much money was placed in, into building that building to make a statement Paying for the land, January 30th, 1658, is mounted on the Pavonia Avenue side and is a depiction painted by Millet of the purchase of the Bergen settlement by the Dutch. On the opposite wall, he painted the repulse of the Dutch, September 13th, 1609, showing an unsuccessful attempt by Henry Hudson to land in the Hackensack Meadows. General Washington at Fort Lee watching the assault upon Fort Washington was painted by Turner. He also painted the first passage of the steamer Claremont to Albany. In this painting, Turner used a common Renaissance custom and he included himself in the mural. He is the man to the left in the green coat. The four corners of this floor originally contained eight lunettes painted by Kenyon Cox. They represented liberty, law, and the six judicial virtues, justice, rectitude, courage, moderation, wisdom, and learning. The last four of those lunettes were stolen while the courthouse was abandoned and eventually replaced with copies of the surviving paintings. There are four courtrooms on the fourth floor and Millet designed each room differently. The courtrooms each emulate a different architectural style and they are all illuminated by a stained glass skylight. 
The superior courtroom facing the present-day administration building is done in the Roman style, featuring province clear pilasters of gray marble. The stained glass skylight in this room has the word Lex, Latin for law, inscribed in the center. The superior courtroom facing Pavonia Avenue is done in the Greek style. It contains 20 marble columns against a background of gray marble and seals of our national bird, the bald eagle, decorate the rear and front wall of the courtroom. Facing Baldwin Avenue, the county courtroom is done in an Italian Renaissance style. It features Swiss Apollonian pilasters with wainscoting of statuary marble. The county courtroom facing Newark Avenue has a Roman style influence and East Indian mahogany covers the bottom half of the walls around the courtroom. When Millet designed the courtrooms, he decided to make them as simple in their ornamentation as he could. The main focus would be in the civil matters occurring in the rooms, not the courtroom itself. Unfortunately, the courthouses were among the last of Millet's works of art. He was lost in the sinking of the Titanic in April 1912. Now when the building first opened, this was the entire seat of county government. So in addition to, to the courtrooms, you had the, the surrogates court, you had uh, the, the, ca the county school superintendent was in this building, the map maker, the sheriff's office. So, and, and again, I get the point is there that county government was very small in, in, in not just in New Jersey or, or Hudson County, but throughout the country. In 1989, four years after the courthouse reopened, freeholders voted to name the building the Hudson County Justice William J. Brennan Jr. Courthouse in his honor. Brennan was a United States Supreme Court Justice who had served as Hudson County's assignment judge from 1949 to 1951. He graduated from Harvard Law School in 1931 and served at the U.S. Supreme Court, being named by Dwight Eisenhower shortly before the election in 1956. The Hudson County Courthouse was always called just that, the Hudson County Courthouse. After its restoration, uh, they did give it the name, the Will Justice William Brennan Courthouse. Justice Brennan was the logical person to be to name the courthouse after, because we didn't have any other person in New Jersey who became a justice of the United States Supreme Court. He had also rendered many very, very important decisions. Prior to 1947, New Jersey was reputed to have the worst court system in the country. Terrible. In 1947, we adopted a new constitution. And as I think lawyers and judges and experts in this field will tell you, we went from the worst to probably the best judicial system in the country. And as part of the new judicial system, the state was divided into vicinages. If you had a county, a large county like Hudson, that's one vicinage. If you had small counties, it'd be three or four counties. And a judge would be appointed to be the assignment judge, basically the chief judge for that vicinage, responsible only to the chief justice. And Justice Brennan was basically the first assignment judge in Hudson County. He came to the induction ceremonies, dedication ceremonies, he spoke, uh, Chief Justice Will Lentz was there of the New Jersey Supreme Court. He spoke, I spoke, other people spoke. Justice Brennan's opening words were uh, really brought down the house. If you know anything about the history of Hudson County, it's always been a Democratic Party stronghold. Ever since the days of Mayor Haig, Frank Haig, I am the law of New Jersey. Uh, the Democrats have ruled Hudson County and they've always brought in large majorities. I uh, was here, I think, about three years. I came, I believe, in March of 1949 and remained here until I went on the appellate division. I believe it was 1952. And then later to the Supreme Court. And very interestingly, I was appointed to the Superior Court, a Democrat 
No, not Hudson County variety, but we had some in <laughs> Essex County by a Republican governor. I was promoted to the appellate division by a Republican Chief Justice. I was appointed to the Supreme Court by a Republican governor. I was appointed to the United States Supreme Court by President Eisenhower. Now I leave it to you. <laughs> what do I owe the Democrats? <laughs> We're very proud of our judicial system in New Jersey. As I said, we are considered to have the best judicial system. We're certainly one of the best in the United States. In fact, Justice Brennan in his speech said the United States Supreme Court better look over its shoulder because New Jersey is catching up. <laughs> and to have that reputation and then to have someone go in a courthouse like this, which is just filled with uh, beautiful objects, wonderful murals, uh, a sense of dignity, of purpose, of justice. It really makes the average person using the courthouse recognize the importance of the judiciary. Cox's lunettes were not the only works to have suffered vandalism. Also on the second floor above the marble wainscoting, only eight of the original 12 panels designed by Millet have survived. They were depictions relative to the county, more notably transportation, since Hudson County was once the railroad capital of the eastern United States. The most significant room on this floor, and in the building, however, is the General Equity Court, which is now, as a term of endearment, referred to as the Pyle Room. Three murals painted by Howard Pyle adorn the walls. The ceiling was designed in an English Renaissance style, and the chandelier is made of brass and wood. In addition, in 1910, uh, certainly the Freeholder Board met here. And they met on the second floor uh, in the room that's called the Pyle, Howard Pyle Room, which now is a courtroom, but that was where the Freeholders met for their caucuses as well as for the public meetings. Each mural in this room illustrates a scene from local history. The coming of the Dutch takes place in 1609 and shows the half moon at anchor while the natives approach it in canoes. In the coming of the English, Dutch governor, General Peter Stuyvesant, realizes he must surrender to the British fleet in 1664. This third mural is a depiction of the first settlement of Manhattan Island. By 1967, all offices had moved next door to the administration building, and the courthouse was officially closed. Both nature and man played equal roles in destroying the building, and the old courthouse became a place of ruin. Then what happened is, we got in there, there was no, uh, all the bronze, you know, the thieves got in there, and they stole everything they could get their hands on. You got to understand when we walked in that building, it basically looked like Frankenstein's castle because it was shut down for nine years and it was totally raped. There was nobody paid attention to it, the water leaking in. It was really, there was one light bulb coming down from the ceiling and that was it. The last year, I believe, of, of the actual working courthouse, the, uh, the building's public life was probably about 1965. So the building was closed and for all intent and purposes was abandoned. And I think there's a quote from American Heritage Magazine, which covered the, 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 the struggle, the fight to save the building. Um, and it had the quote, I believe it said that it was the worst case of benign neglect of a public building in American history. That may or may not be true, but that pretty much summed it up. And again, we are looking back, we are sitting in hindsight looking in the past. Um, the building was not protected. Maybe they didn't have the manpower to have either sheriff's officers, or in those days there was a county police force to have a 24-hour presence here. So by not having the, any kind of presence here, the building was badly uh, vandalized, and it was, people got in here for a lot of reasons. There were vagrants living here. Um, persons got in here, they vandalized the murals, they tore them. There were a lot of thefts of, of works of art in here in terms of the, the ornamentation, the sconces were stolen. 
We don't know whether they were stolen for, for value by collectors, whether by vagrants who would then sell them for scrap, and brass, and so forth. The damage was so great, it seemed almost irreparable. The wooden panels had been ripped out, and the marble floors were stained and spotted. Almost every bronze railing, doorknob, and light fixture was stolen. Walls were crumbling, and water had destroyed the murals, plaster, and marble sculptures. The dome and the stained glass also suffered great damage. It was falling apart, and the glass was shattered in some places. The few panels left were saved and used as templates for recreating the dome. According to Hudson County Planning Director Lawrence Campagna, every room, every floor, and every hallway had suffered damage. They uh, let the rain run through the building for I don't know how many years and all the plaster and everything. Don't forget that courthouse is all plaster, not, no, no sheetrock. I don't forget that sheetrock. We went back to all wire lift and plaster on it. And uh, all that was deteriorated, falling down and all because the water was running through the building. It was running right down from the roof down right down to the bottom. And they, they didn't care because they were going to rip the building down. That, that was their theory. But there were plans of restoring the courthouse before it fell into disuse. In 1961, Theodore Conrad proposed converting the building into a new city hall for Jersey City. The plan would have created a mall in front of the building and surrounded it with city buildings and a museum. However, as the courthouse fell apart more and more each day, there were more talks of it being demolished to make way for a parking lot. I started to hear the story about how the building was slated to be, to be torn down. And my first introduction to that period was by the late Ted Conrad. Um, Ted was one of many people who stayed at the building, and he, he played a, a, a pivotal role, uh, by all means, certainly. But he was my, my mentor in terms of learning about the building and the, the county architecture. We'd go in his, he this huge, I think it was the Cadillac, and uh, we'd, he'd, he'd say, you have a long lunch hour, hop in the car, I'll give you a nickel tour around the county. And then we'd drive around, and he would tell me the stories about the buildings, and he'd tell me the story about this building. Back in the day, he, he had some Europeans here and he was showing them the sites in New York, the architecture, like the public library and so forth. And when they came back to New Jersey, he was passing the courthouse. This was before it was saved. And he said, they're going to make this a parking lot for the new courthouse. And the people were aghast. They, how could you do this? You know, America came into Europe and helped us after World War II restore our buildings that were bombed, and then you're not going to save your own magnificent building. One thing I think people uh, should know was that uh, that building was almost, almost as good as gone, uh, and it wasn't until a, a very determined group of, of local activists uh, led by Ted Conrad organized to save it. One of the other fellows in one of our files here mentioned how it would take uh, a uh, war effort of dynamite to knock it down because it was meant to stand a long time. Ted Conrad was an architectural modelist who had great interest in buildings of historical significance. He built a model of the courthouse and led a citizens group that lobbied for its preservation. After many meetings with lawmakers and lawyers, they finally got it listed on the National Register of Historic Places on August 25th, 1970. Today there are nonprofit organizations such as the Jersey City Landmarks Conservancy, which fight to preserve landmarks of historical significance. Their mission is to preserve, protect, and promote the architectural, cultural, and environmental heritage of Jersey City. It started uh, in 1999, uh, and the organization coalesced around the planned demolition of the Hudson Manhattan Railroad powerhouse in downtown Jersey City. Um, those people who are from Jersey City will recall it's the building that is uh, along Washington Boulevard in downtown Jersey City behind the Harborside Terminal. Uh, it used to provide the power for the Hudson Manhattan Railroad, which is now the path. Uh, and in the late 90s, it was slated for demolition. And John Gomez, who uh, many people might recall from the Legends and Landmarks column in the Jersey Journal, uh, formed an organization to uh, advocate for its 
preservation. And uh, the building was placed on the National Register of Historic Landmarks, uh, thanks to John Gomez and his uh, organization's efforts. Uh, that organization was the uh, Landmarks Conservancy. Well, there are a lot of different things that could uh, make a building uh, eligible for historic status. Uh, obvious, obviously, the probably most common element would be architectural features that make it an outstanding example of a building of a particular time period, or perhaps uh, an outstanding example of a particular designer's work. Um, perhaps if the building was the site of a particular historic event, um, if it was associated with a particular individual who had uh, an important contribution to society, whether state, local, or national. Uh, some buildings have uh, multiple, uh, uh, fit multiple criteria. Uh, in the case of the courthouse, uh, you, you certainly see that it's a building of uh, tremendous architectural value. Uh, it was the site of uh, an important uh, historic figure's uh, judgeship, William uh, J. Brennan, for a period of time, so it meets those criteria. In 1973, county officials sought federal and state funding to refurbish the building and in 1974, federal EDA funds, as well as state artistic preservation funds, became available. Larry Campagna, the Hudson County Planning Director, then proposed a 10-year program to restore the courthouse. It was approved, and restoration began that year, in 1975. In order to keep within that budget, CETA, the Comprehensive Employment Training Act workers, local artists, and craftsmen were hired to do the job under the supervision of Ernest Grabich. Contracting a private company would have raised the costs of the restoration well over the $4 million mark. I was part of the CETA program, which brought, I think, 150 men from all over this county, from each town and city. And the larger the city or town, the more were able to come from that particular area. I was one of two that came from Sea Caucus. Don't forget, in 1974, 75, you know, Nixon had resigned and the country went through uh, a financial fallout and uh, people were out of work like they are today. And um, people were struggling to just survive. Even union people couldn't get work. And, and when they developed to uh, restore this building, uh, they took all of these people, and uh, if you would, manifested this program, uh, not just here in this county building, but in other buildings in the county, the hospitals, the park systems, and such, and even in the court systems. And they would uh, delegate jobs to really untrained, unskilled people uh, who were put in positions that they, f if they felt they could achieve success in. I had to get a whole crew together, two tin knockers, two electricians, two carpenters, the whole different in trades. I got everybody in there, and that's, uh, we set up the whole crew. It was Campania's goal to not just rebuild the courthouse, but to recreate it. And since there was no immediate need for the building, they could give as much attention to the historical and architectural detail as possible. Campania was quoted to have said, not one square inch of this place has been left unexamined. It wasn't a thing that had to be done, you know. It was a restoration job. And the idea was to put it back the way it was. So it wasn't a job that was uh, where you had to meet a deadline or anything. It was just the idea of putting it back and making it look beautiful again. The team replaced thousands of square feet of wainscoting glass window panes, stained glass and brass railings. New plumbing, electrical lines, and plaster walls were installed, and anything that could be repaired was fixed and reinstalled. Since much of the bronze work was stolen while the building was in ruins, Ernest Grabich and his crew decided to build a foundry in the basement. This allowed them to duplicate the stolen pieces, such as the many adorned doorknobs, at a much lower cost. Well, we set a foundry up in the basement. We made all the, the plates, all the doorknobs. We made all the railings for the third floor. We cast them ourselves because we went out to foundries to find out about casting them, and the prices was outrageous the, that they wanted to cast these. So when we set up our foundry, we, we did everything that was missing, you know? We, even some of the lamp parts and all we cast, and we cast everything uh, that we could, and it turned out, it turned out really good. 
The restoration of the stained glass required a lot of care. The color is created by adding metallic salts during its manufacture. Stained glass windows consist of small panels arranged to form patterns or pictures held together by strips of lead and supported by a rigid frame. Of the 24 panels that made up the dome, eight had to be completely reconstructed and the remaining 16 were restored. Uh, the dome, which is 20 feet in diameter and is a uh, neoclassical style, uh, multicolor opalescent glass as well as uh, medium middle opalescent glass. And about 85% of it was completely lost. So it was literally shraggled in uh, hanging from its, its uh, foundations and its frame. And uh, when you were 105 feet below in the lower building and you looked up here to the rotunda, uh, visibly you saw shredded wheat. It was, there was really nothing to see. I think the county was looking to hire an outside studio. They were Duran Studios from New York City, who I tootled under. And uh, their numbers were very high, I think somewhere near 180, 200,000 to do it. And we did it in-house for, I would say, about $12,000. And uh, I chose uh, five people from the county, Angela Sinisi, uh, Rich Capelli, Louis Guzman, uh, Billy Larson, and eventually uh, Patty Ruvalo came to work with us on the total restoration and they all were schooled and tootled as well. And uh, I think Duran Studios, when they saw the finished product, said they couldn't do a better job than, than we did at the time, which was amazing because my knowledge of stained glass was only what I saw in churches and in buildings as in my youth. And it just from that day to this day, which is like 35 years later, I'm still working at it. I think the most difficult task was lowering what we had that was left to the lower area and then bringing what was restored to the higher area. Basically, you take it down, see what you, uh, you have to soak it in a, a lye solution. You put it, you let it soak according, according to the damage on it, but usually two days and, and the lye solution in water in a big giant tank. You just basically let it soak and it'll take off all the dirt, it'll take paint off, it'll take anything off. It took off whatever kind of damage was on the glass. And when you take it out of the lye solution, you see where your damage is in the glass, what has to be replaced. The lead, naturally, you have to resolder and re-lead most of it. You can get by sometimes on certain restorations by saving the old lead if it's not that bad, but 90% of the restoration should be re-leaded. That way you have a nice piece that's going to last basically another 100 years, because the glass itself would look like it was cut yesterday. That's how good the lye solution cleans it up. We had to kind of find out where the lead areas went and rebuild it structurally, and once we got that down, then we were able to take a rubbing of it, and so on, so on. These men labored in many ways no different than probably the Egyptians did when they were building the pyramids. I mean, this building is nothing like many buildings that you could find in America. I consider it one of the 10 best buildings in America. And uh, where can you go in a rotunda 105 feet and look up to a Tiffany dome? Where can you see artists' work, like the murals downstairs and, and the pendentas off the, the four corners, as beautiful as you could find in this building? Um, Hollywood has showed it so. They love filming in here. The, um, you know, there are many movies that were made here. Even early on during black and white television, uh, there were many movies made here. The uh, Hudson County Justice Brennan Courthouse is, has been in demand since I've been here and even before. And it's, it's, a, it's unique and there are so many productions that look for a, a courthouse of this style for, uh, for a location set. And uh, we've had many productions shot here, as, as you inquired. And uh, because it's a working courthouse, we really are limited to when we can allow uh, film production here, or video production for that matter, or TV production. And um, normally, if a company wants to shoot, they have to be willing to shoot on weekends uh, when obviously there's no functions going on here. So in my time here, we've had two movies that I recall being the big productions uh, that we're able to work on our schedule. The one that comes to mind is a film called Family Business starring Dustin Hoffman, Sean Connery, and Matthew Broderick. And Hurricane, starring Denzel Washington, 
and shot by the great director, Norman Jewison. And they were here for a couple days. And again, we've turned down a lot of offers because of the, being a functioning courthouse. Restoring the Zodiac alone took approximately two years and was done by Christy Gravich and Angela Sinisi. She painted the, the uh, uh, Zodiac with my brother. To do a painting on a Zodiac and all that, he had to go up there, my brother, and put, the, put paper up, trace it all, and then what they did is they take a little perforated thing and they make holes in the paper, and then they put it up there and they do it with powder, and then they get the outline, and then they paint the Zodiac back in again. And uh, it, it worked out really good on that there thing. The next thing happened, Larry Companion said to me, we're going we're gonna to rent scaffolds to get to the dome. You're down in the lobby and you look up to the ceiling, right? So he says, we're going to get scaffold in. And I said to Larry, you've got to be crazy. You've got to get scaffold in. I've got to put the scaffold up. It's going to cost you over $5,000 just to get the parts here. I've got to erect it. And you're going to pay about $2,000 a month or so for the scaffolding to be in here. And Christy took over a year to paint everything up there and all that. So I says to him, I tell you what to do. I'll fix it up. I went and I, bought, I told the engineer I had, I said, tell me how, how much, how big a truss I have to put across the third floor from, column, from balcony to across that opening. And he told me and I got the truss. We, we got the truss put up. And then I ordered plywood and beams and I made a deck up there. And, I, and then I made the deck, I made a scaffold to go from the deck up to the dome and what we did is we, we put it on wheels so that my brother and the other artists could paint, go down, push it. And we pinned the middle of it with a pin and we went out on it like a fan and we made a scaffold so they could work off. And they pushed it around, they kept pushing it around as they worked on the dome. The murals were either replaced with duplicates or restored using pieces left of the canvases. Most conservators today are a combination of scientist, artist, and art historian. They work as much as they can to, to uh, restore it to it so that it looks to the average person exactly like it would have originally looked, but they also make it completely reversible so that an expert would know what they had done, any in-painting that they had done, and that could be reversed if a better method or somebody changed their minds later in, later in the life of the painting. The restoration process took a total of 10 years and another $1.5 million to complete, and the Hudson County Justice William J. Brennan Courthouse reopened in 1985. The restoration was such a success that the courthouse was honored with the Victorian Society of America Preservation Award in 1988. It was an amazing transformation. They did a great, great job on it. I mean, we, we did a lot of the work on it too, but just restoring the paintings up on the fourth floor. I mean, it's just an amazing job. But the building deserved to be restored. It was, it's just a fantastic building. But we had no plans. We just went in there with a whole crew, and it was our job to put the courthouse back together. So that's what we did. Each gang took his own thing to do it, and, and they did it, and it worked out great. And uh, everybody was very happy. That was one thing about it. Everybody was, you know, like a family in there. And they all worked together. The Brennan Courthouse, now being used for civil matters, houses a few offices for county organizations and hosts local art exhibits and community events. It is under constant maintenance and restorations are ongoing. That isn't without cost. You know, the, when you came in here today, you saw the huge cranes outside working in the interior. We've replaced a lot of the ornate lighting uh, over the years at the cost of millions of dollars, both in taxpayer money and in grants that we've received from the the uh, state government, but I think it's our, our obligation uh, to do that is to, you know, to preserve this building. Well, the restoration is, is ongoing and I, I'm happy to say that uh, the, the county has really been uh, steadfast in bringing it back to its original splendor. And I think we're just about there. I mean, the torche lamps in the fourth floor are being installed as we speak. Um, the dome. I think the, the final phase will certainly be the, to restore the murals, uh, the, especially the, the pendentives by Blashfield in the dome. 
and to review the, uh, the four murals on the fourth floor by Turner and uh, Millet. What we offer now, as you mentioned, is addition to just the basic uh, needs of the public coming to business here. We have ethnic programs in the evening. We, we, we celebrate the various uh, cultural uh, heritage of the county. So in the evenings, on occasion, we will honor a certain uh, group, uh, a special day, a flag raising, we call it. And then for the cultural uh, resource of our people, we have an art gallery. And uh, we have a very unique, uh, very ingenious uh, little format down there. Um, when we were asked by the county executive to provide a, a gallery space for local artists, professionals as well as uh, amateurs and our senior citizen artists and our students who are talented, we didn't want to make any kind of permanent changes that would have uh, marred the, the integrity of the rotunda. So we have a system where they are attached temporarily to the wall through a, a rubber disc. So that gives a, um, a, a really unique space for artists to have their work seen by so many people during the, the work day. And then the, uh, the, the newer addition to the use of the building is our, our music series. We, do, we have a, a, a folk music series and we call the space the Bread and Coffee House. Um, we found that there was a need for music space in this part of not just Hudson County, but uh, this part of New Jersey, Northeast New Jersey. So once a month for nine months, we, we turn the rotunda into a little coffee house. So we have round tables and we have candlelight. And we've had some of the great names of acoustic and folk music performed here from around the world. And it's been very successful. One thing that I would say about the courthouse and I would say about historic preservation is that above all, it's important for cities and communities to uh, reflect in the built environment a sense of time. Uh, Lewis Mumford once said that cities, great cities are places where time is made visible. And what he meant by that is he, he sensed that great cities are places where you walk down the street and you can see different eras in the built form. You can see an Art Deco building next to a neoclassical building. Uh, you can see a, a glass skyscraper near a, uh, you know, a Dutch colonial church. What I think is, is wonderful about artists is that they, they often have a message and they are, they are interpreters of history and as I said I think they're often among the, the most forward thinking people of their day. They're in touch with other intellectuals. They're often among the most liberal members of society. So I like very much looking at history through the work of artists. And I don't think that, um, as time goes by, I think that they still, paintings from a certain time always tell you a lot about that time and about how, how people were thinking. On September 20th, 2010, the courthouse celebrated its own anniversary. This year marked the Hudson County Justice William J. Brennan Courthouse's 100th year since it opened its doors. It was a celebration that not only honored the building, but also the many people involved in the different stages of its existence. What we would have lost if we lost the courthouse was not just a piece of architecture or an actual building, but we would have also lost a link to a particular era. Well, I think the future of getting back to the precedent. If you stand well, stand still. And I cannot imagine um, in my lifetime or anyone's lifetime, the future generations who will come in this building, who will work here, will have my job and will have all the other jobs here, whether they be lawyers or judges, that this building not be here. I mean, this, this I think, you know, um, in talking to the county executive of the GS once before, we both kind of agree this is like the symbol of Hudson County. I mean, it truly is. It's, it's been here. It's a rock. Um, it serves all people of all faiths, of all race, religion, whatever. Um, it serves many purposes. Uh, we've discussed now it's not just judiciary, it's also the public good in, in a cultural resource way. So I, I would imagine it'll be here for many, many years. I'd like to think it'll be here another hundred years. Thousands of hours of skilled craftsmanship and careful artistry went into the creation of the courthouse, and thousands more were invested to restore it to its rightful place as our county's cathedral of justice. As long as its people will defend it, the courthouse will stand, and as long as it stands, future generations will bear witness to its magnificence.